That's the preacher.
Christmas, church. Merry Christmas. Welcome to Blanco Methodist Church this morning. And to whoever it was that asked Santa Claus for the rain, thank you. We appreciate you staying on the, the nice list all, all year long. We all appreciate that. And if you would ask for more, since it's not quite Christmas yet, we would appreciate that. If you please rise as you're able, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Our call to worship this morning is angels from the realm of glory. From the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. He who sang creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what anticipation we have this morning. It's a wonderful thing whenever Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday when all of the focus is on you, where we can come and worship you in the morning and just let that anticipation grow all day into tomorrow when you give us that greatest gift. Lord, thank you so much for aligning these things for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 238, Angels We Have Heard on High. And I think we might be flying blind, so get out your red hymnal and we'll sing it that way. (laughs) Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The 
Good morning. Howdy. Merry Christmas. My name is Jean McCord, and I'm honored to read to you this morning. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they do divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their impressors, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tolment, the cloak rolled in blood, will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to behold it with the justice of righteousness. For then, from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And finally, if you would remain standing for our Advent reading by the Rolex this morning. Fourth Sunday of Advent. The fourth candle on the Advent wreath is known as the angel's candle. It speaks of love and of the actual coming of the Christ. Holy light ignites in the sky. Shepherds shake and angels sing. Their light is a beacon of hope. Their presence is a message of mercy. Their words write a love letter from our holy God. God has graced the world with the Christ. We light this candle as a symbol of purity. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, purify us that we may be ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel. It is declared in the Holy Scriptures, and at once with the angel, there was a throng of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those he favors. You may be seated. Uh, please sign in those booklets in the center aisle. Let us know you are here. Or likewise, if you happen to be watching online, let us know who's watching on your login. And go ahead and send your prayer request in so we can get those on these prayer cards for later on in the service. A couple of announcements to make and corrections in the bulletin. Um, the Bible study on Thursday will be at the Moore's house, not at the Miller's house. So if you go to the Miller's house, they'll probably be at the Moore's. So they won't even be able to let you in. Uh, so if, if y'all would please make that correction. Uh, the office is closed most of this week. They're doing half days on Tuesday and Wednesday. Which half? So, somewhere in the middle every other hour. Just come up here, you'll find them in the morning. Uh, otherwise, we'll be busy celebrating Christmas all week long. Uh, next Sunday is fifth Sunday, so we'll be having one combined service at 10, but I understand we're not going to do a potluck as it is New Year's Eve. So we'll have one combined service in here at 10 a.m. next Sunday. Uh, Frank is going to come up and invite you all to some of our Bible study opportunities as the new year is upon us. I'll make it quick. Uh, we, I encourage you to read through the Bible in a year. We've got the Bible pathways back in the back. And we have two groups. One meets at 2 o'clock on Tuesday. And one meets at uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday. And it's a great time. You know, you can read through the Bible <laughs> And you're getting your uh, information on it. But when you go to a group and you hear other people <coughs> reading the same verse and they get a different interpretation, it's really life-changing. It grows. Uh, especially our Thursday night group, uh, we, we're getting pretty hot. So if you want to, <laughs> you might want to come to that one because it's, it's exciting. And the 2 o'clock one is getting more exciting. So 
uh, I encourage you to get a pathway back in the back and, and join us. You can start this, this uh, Tuesday or Thursday, and we'll finish Revelation and then start in Genesis uh, the next week. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And I also want to invite you all to our Sunday school classes. Uh, the one I host is typically over here in the chapel. We do current event type studies. We're currently going through uh, the chapters of Romans that deal with Israel. Today we are going to have that in here because Missler's commentary is an hour-long video on the history of Israel, and there's lots of graphics, so I want the sound system and I want the, the screen to do that. So if anybody wants to join us, uh, feel free to do that today. It's about an hour-long video. He covers like 3,500 years of history in an hour, so it's pretty impressive and pretty intense. Uh, but it's really interesting, and it has a lot to do with current events, especially with what's going on over there right now. There's lots of pertinent points to pick up on it. And then we can springboard from that, because I think this is like 2006 is when he recorded this. Uh, so more things have unfolded since then, and it kind of sheds some light on some of the thoughts of the imminence of the return of Christ. Uh, Brian's Bible study is over in the Dot Miller room. It's a more traditional pick a book of the Bible and read through it and study it in depth. Uh, both of those are great opportunities for fellowship and study in the Word, so I encourage you to do those. Anything else? Uh, there's no youth activities this week as, as everybody's off from school. That's correct, Troy? Anything else we need to announce for the church this morning? Yes, Aaron. Gospel Circle, Wednesday Gospel Circle is back on schedule for January 3rd, awesome. 6 o'clock. First that Wednesday Gospel Circle. The first Wednesday of the month is at 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. over in the social hall. So if you like gospel music, yes, ma'am. Fantastic. I did fail to mention we have Sunday school for our kids, which is rather important, especially since I have some, so you think I would remember. Uh, but uh, get them involved in that. It's really important to get that basis. Uh, I had it all growing up, and something interesting happened kind of in light of that. Uh, about three weeks ago, I got a wild hair to make a sourdough yeast culture so I could make sourdough bread and all sorts of that kind of stuff. And it turned into a Bible lesson. Because if you read in Leviticus about the Passover rules, they're supposed to get all the leaven out of their house and throw it away. And that's representative of sin and what we're supposed to do in our lives, right? But that doesn't seem like a congruent thing. You just go in there and grab your yeast packets and throw them in the trash can. And then after Passover, you run down to HEB and you grab a jar of Fleischmann's and you're back in business. You know, it's, that, that's kind of, that's not really equivalent to digging the sin out of your life. But then I made this sourdough yeast culture, and it's a pain. I mean, it takes daily work and then weekly work, and if it's not exactly right, it doesn't make very good bread, and it eats up a lot of flour. So take that back to the time when God told his people to do that, and imagine that sacrifice. It starts to hit a little more, more deeply. And going through that week without decent bread, which also very important to have good fiber in your diet, amen? Yeah. So you're giving that up for a week, and then it's going to take you another week or so to get that going. It's, it's a lot more of a challenge. And then you got to buy all that flour, which wasn't a cheap thing back then. So uh, it's funny how just something that simple, just a wild hair, when you look at it through a biblical lens, gets a lot deeper into the weeds and teaches you something more than just how to make good sourdough bread. So I encourage you to do that with your own life. Something pops up, look at it through that biblical lens. See, what, see what's deeper there to learn. There's, there's lots you can pick up there. Pastor, let's go to prayer. Good morning. Good morning. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Man, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We come into his house and lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? And one of the neat things in the scripture reading today, we saw that his name shall be called. Now, this is about the Messiah. This is about Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. And one name, the longest name in scripture, is Pele Yad Sel Gibor Abi Yad Sar Shalom. Did you hear that? That is one name. The, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. The eternal Father, the Prince of Peace, the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. We need to know who we're worshiping. God is with us. Boy, if we could just catch a glimpse of his glory today. And remember that Christmas 
is the celebration, not of our salvation, but of the promise kept that our Savior arrived according to the Scripture. God is a God who keeps his promises. And as we approach prayer, let's keep that in mind. Man, in Jesus, we see the fullness of the glory of God face to face. And guess what? He is love. He is gracious. He's a Savior. Opens his arms and says, would you receive him? I hope and pray you'll say yes today that all of us. It's not just saying yes to salvation. That's the most important thing you can do. But yes to letting him live in, in and through your life. To be present with us. So my prayer is that as we approach these prayers, we keep in mind that our God is with us. Okay, so now you've got something for the next Bible trivia time you have with your family, just in case they ever even care, uh, since they might have just a hard enough time saying Jesus. So... Uh, let's continue with our time of, with prayer, and please keep in mind our prayer cards. Uh, we're going to ask that you write them down. Uh, every concern that you have, we will place them on the altar, uh, and usually Rick, our associate, uh, takes care of that, but he's at home sick, uh, and we have quite a number of people that are at home sick uh, today, so uh, if, if you want to write their names that you know on a card, and let's bring them up. Uh, at, you'll hand them to the ushers during the offertory, then we'll, we'll uh, lift them up here and put them on the prayer rail. Uh, we need to be a people that are in active ministry praying for one another. Amen? Amen. Okay, so, uh, uh, and but let's not wait until our prayer time to thank God for the rain that we have received, okay? So, I mean, that is just so nice just to see it. Uh, Lord, for your goodness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are you really glad, Lord, for your goodness? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, one announcement, I, and I, I don't know, I don't think you said it was obvious, but tonight, <laughs> tonight, uh, at 7 o'clock, there's going to be a Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service, communion service here. The choir has quite a few special numbers they've been working on, uh, and they have been diligent. I mean, they, you would think that if you're, you could just come up and just sing. No, they practice. And if they're practicing today, they've been practicing at, at weird times. I come up here when it's the choir. They're practicing. So if they've been doing that for us, would you come out tonight? Bring your family. Bring your friends. If they said they had to bring clothes, send them home because you don't want mutis. If they're, whatever they're wearing, you bring them to church and say, hey, come check out our choir. Right? Amen. Okay. Okay, so let's keep that in mind as uh, we uh, celebrate the birth of the Savior. Um, again, our prayer hymn uh, is in our bulletin. Uh, it's, What Child Is This? And let's use this to focus our minds and our hearts on uh, the reason that we're here, the God who is faithful. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping? This, this is Christ the King who
Would you bow your heads with me and let us be in an attitude of prayer? Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the bright morning star, the one who is worthy to be praised. Worthy is the Lamb. We come into your house this day on this Christmas Eve to celebrate you, to celebrate the Almighty God who created all things by your word, who became one of us, took on human form, and introduced yourself to us as the God who is love, the God who is grace and mercy, the God who is holy and just, the one who is eternal. And Lord God, even when you came, your people did not recognize you. And they did not receive the light of your glory. Oh, but we pray, Lord God, before we judge your people of the past, we bow before you as a people now, may we not fail to see the fullness of the glory of Almighty God in the face of Jesus. May we realize who it is that we're worshiping and what it is that we're doing. Forgive us, Lord God, for ever thinking that going to church is a religious obligation, something that we just do whether driven by culture or the expectations of a family. But it's the opportunity to come before the King. To worship the almighty God in spirit and truth. To realize that when your presence comes, your people are transformed. Oh, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and do a work in this church. Do a work in the churches of this community. We pray, Lord God, that you would capture the hearts of your people. That you would anoint the preaching of your word. Every pastor is there preaching. That they would realize that they are instruments of your grace and glory. We pray for anointing, and we pray for an awareness that something spiritual is happening even in our midst. Forgive us, Lord God, for ever judging a people of the past who didn't show up at the fulfillment of a promise. The scriptures, the prophecies have been fulfilled, and you were born in Bethlehem according to the scripture. Wise men from the east came, bearing the gifts according to the scripture. Lord Jesus, even as now you are fulfilling scriptures, even in our day, we pray that your church would be aware, our eyes would be open, and we would realize that we are your people called at this time for the manifestation of your glory and to be witnesses for you. That the king has come and the king is coming again. We pray, Lord Jesus, you'd be exalted in your church. May we never forget to gaze upon the cross and realize that on that cross you paid a price that no one else could pay, but you paid in full for our sins. And you said it is finished. So, Lord Jesus, we look at that cross as a celebration and a victory. The covenant fulfilled. And the doors and gates of hell destroyed. And the doors of heaven opened to all who would receive. So we come. We come and we say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. And we receive you as our king. Be the Lord and Savior of our lives. We come. We pray, Lord God, over this Christmas time as family and friends are gathered together Oh, forgive us for making this day of celebration a secular event. May it be a time where somehow in the midst of maybe a song we sing or a, a scripture we read or it may be even a card that has the message of salvation on it, may we be able to hear your voice speaking through uh, all the trappings of this season and say it's all about Jesus. The promise has been made. The promise has been kept. And the invitation is still out until that day when you return. Lord God, may we receive, may some of our family members, may they open their hearts to you and receive your grace. May this be a day where the day of salvation moves in fullness 
And may more people come to know you, Lord Jesus. And may the church be restored to what we are called to be. A place where the presence of God is felt. And your word is preached. And your glory is manifest. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and do that work in us. Now Lord in the light of all those things. The glory of your purposes being fulfilled. We lift up every need and concern before you. From our cancer survivors and their caregivers. To our troops and first responders and their families. And for your grace to be with them. To those who are traveling and those who are sick. We lay all these needs before you, and we pray for every Christian that is struggling right now, Lord, whether it's with anxiety or depression or addictions. You know the struggles that we have in our families, in our homes, and we pray for deliverance. And we pray, Lord God, that even as you fill your churches with your glory, that each of us would allow you to be the Lord of our homes and that your presence would be felt in our homes and our relationships. May this be a day of celebration, a day of deliverance, a day of revival, of renewal, of redemption. And may the church have our eyes open to see what our God is doing. We ask now that you would hear us as we pray over all these prayers and every need and over every family and every home. Even as we now join our voices together to pray that prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. come forward. Thank y'all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, on the eve of the greatest gift that could ever be given, let us impress upon our hearts that it's right to give as best as we can to you. Even though we know that it's going to pale in comparison to that <coughs> gift of Jesus, let us give boldly anyway. Empower us so. It's in Christ's name that we pray.
God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy standing for our gospel reading this morning from John chapter 1 verses 9 through 13. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Thanks be to God. Why are you dismissed before your feet? Would you welcome one another? <laughs> Margie, you want your water? All right, if you go ahead and grab your seat, good morning. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, Claudia. If you grab your seat. Okay. And uh, it's good to see Steve here this morning. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Steve Sanchez is uh, a pastor, and uh, he is uh, going to be preaching next week right in uh, Candelia. So it's a blessing to have you here with us. Thank you, David Kim. Good to see you guys. Okay, so um, let us bow our heads, and let's um, humble ourselves before the Almighty God. Almighty God, we pray that you would speak to us the word that we need to hear, that we would grow in our faith and our love for you. And Lord Jesus... May we receive a fresh word from you today. Oh, Lord, Lord, we pray a blessing on the preaching of your word in this church and every church right now that is meeting. May there be fresh revelation and excitement in the pews as we anticipate 
not just the advent of this Christmas, celebrating the advent of your coming, but reminding ourselves of the advent that is yet to come. May we, your church, be excited in living in these days and these hours to celebrate the fulfillment of all that's been promised. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I share this story. You've heard it before, but my mom always told me, don't be surprised how many people won't remember because they were either asleep or didn't care. So I'm going to share it again. It's a story that came from a bus driver in Zimbabwe who had a job of transporting uh, residents from a mental hospital, okay? And, but uh, being in the salary bracket where he was just not the most responsible bus driver, he stopped at a bar that was illegal. So he did this in a secretive way, and he left all the residents from the the uh, uh, mental facility in his bus, but he didn't lock the bus. So while he was there doing what you do in an illegal bar in Zimbabwe, all the residents escaped the bus. So when he came out a little inebriated, he discovered nobody was in the bus. So this is what he did. He took his bus and he drove around town to bus stops and he picked up local people. He got 20 people and told them that it was a free ride and he would take care of them. And then he drove them to the mental hospital. And he told the people at the front, he said, now listen, a lot of these guys are disoriented and they're going to tell you crazy things. Don't believe anything. Did you know he got away with that for three days? Can you imagine being one of those people on that bus and being put into a mental hospital and being stuck there for three days until they figured out what all had happened. You know, the truth of the matter is, it was discovered. The truth did come out. You know, a lot of times, not a lot of times, I believe the default in our world today, we're living in a dark day, and the default is there's not going to be a judgment. It's, it's, we're going to get away with it. I mean, some of the things that people do, and I listen, I've stopped listening to the news, is so discouraging. But the, it's like, I guess people don't believe that there's going to be a judgment. There's, you know, that there's, that there's never going to be a day where the light's going to be seen because it's just amazing to me what people are doing and what they think they're going to get away with. You know, dealing with the light is going to be tough. I remember when I was a young kid over in, in, at Ramstein Air Force Base uh, in Germany, and w my parents would let us go to the Saturday matinee. So, you, you know, you go in at noon or at one, and you get the, a, a movie for a quarter. Believe that, when you could buy something for a quarter. And you get in there, and, and uh, we would watch this movie, and I would get lost in the movie and all that was going on, and, and it was always dark in that movie theater, and they would let us out the back door uh, of the movie theater, and then the bright light would hit you. And I remember always being disoriented, always thinking, well, what day is this? What, what's going on? Uh, that happens to me actually just about every morning when I wake up. <laughs> I go, is this Sunday, is it? Uh, last Monday, I freaked out because I thought it was Sunday. I didn't remember that I had preached. And uh, some of you were getting therapy trying to forget that I had preached that long. <laughs> but it was just so funny. I was just sitting, I, the anxiety hit me, and I jumped out of bed I thought, oh, I can't believe it's Sunday and I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And, oh, no, it was Monday. And I'm like, oh, that gives me time. Now, listen, I really believe you and I have been living in this fallen world and the darkness of this fallen world has overtaken the way we think. And there's a, there's a battle that's going on with light and darkness. Last week, I... I I threw the sermon out as being a revelation of glory. Today, I'm taking it. It's very similar, but it's really the revelation of light and the challenge that it is for people who live in darkness to deal with the light because that's really what the Christmas story is all about. Uh, you know, I, I, I made a promise that I was going to make today's sermon really short. Uh, so this is something which is, 
I have preached this before, and so I'm counting on the fact that you know what I'm talking about. Okay, it says in Isaiah 9, 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, and those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Now, we just have to make this really clear. We are the people who live in darkness. We, we are those, we, you know, when we talk about darkness, what it's referring to is we're lost. We don't, know, we don't know what's up and what's down. We don't know what's good, what's bad. We are separated from God. I got, we've got to remember this. Our culture denies this reality. So you go to the schools, you go into higher education, you, you listen to the pundits on TV, and it's as if, no, the darkness is light. That we don't need God. We don't, if we're fine. That we have no problems. And so we have got to come to a point as Christians to realize the number one thing is, no, we are the ones lost and living in darkness. In ourselves. We are a fallen people. We're without God, <coughs> without hope in this world. Now, you know, it, that is, it, even in Christian circles, I mean, the fallen world says, no, 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 mankind, it's, there is no sin, that we are, we are okay, we don't need God. But even in Christendom, I don't think we realize what depravity really is. Listen to how uh, Ephesians uh, 2 starts out. I love this. And you were dead. <laughs> that doesn't sound like And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And then in verse 12, it goes on and it specifies this specifically to the Gentiles, which you and I are most likely part of. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes it very clear. The people who live in darkness, those who are separated from God are in the darkness and they have no hope. They're without God. They're totally, this, living in bondage to our sins and trespasses, we've got to realize the greatness of God's grace. I mean, any evangelical preacher is going to tell you Isaiah 53, verse 6, for all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. For the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Or Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The whole point is before the salvation come, before the Savior and the gift of the Savior could come, we've got to realize our lostness, our depravity. We've got to stop justifying ourselves, and yet we live in a world where we justify ourselves day in and day out. I was at Walmart. And I was just walking back to my car, and I saw this lady. She was done loading her car with her cart. And instead of pushing her cart to the, to the uh, cart receptacle place that you're supposed to take it to, she pushed it, and she aimed at it. And the cart goes, and it wobbled. It, 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 it was like a sheep that had gone astray, and it just started going off, and it went right into a car, boom, into the side of the door. She turned and looked, and she saw me looking at her, and she goes, it was the wind. It was the wind. <laughs> I won't tell you what I was thinking, but I was thinking it pretty obviously with my face. The question is, when are we going to just own the fact that we're not as smart as we think we are? And that when you live in the darkness, you may not even know what true light is. You know, in order to receive a Savior, you've got to realize you're in need of a Savior. I heard it said, some people change when they see the light. Some people, when they feel the heat. 
I hope and pray that the church will respond to the light when we see the light and allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and to draw us to the Savior. The truth of the matter is you can't save yourself. It's our, uh, even our righteous deeds are as filthy rags according to Isaiah 64. And then if you look at Matthew, and we've read this before, but this is again the basic gospel message in the Christmas story. Matthew 5 Verse 21, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now, friends, when I read this, I realize that people say the God of the Old Testament is mean. He's, he's holy, and he's not letting his people get away with anything. But if you read the words of Jesus, you discover, oh, my gosh, yes, God is love, and he's our Savior, but his life condemns us. The fact he lived a perfect life of love condemns us because we don't. Because he lived in light reveals our darkness. And when he, he holds us to the holy standards of God, and he says, have you ever been angry with someone? Then you deserve to go to hell. Have you ever called someone a fool? You deserve, That's every one of us here. I want to see every hand up. Have you called someone a fool before any time in your life? Then he says you deserve to go not just to hell but to fiery hell. Why does he have to put that descriptor on there? You know, and I'm sitting there going, man, fiery hell. You know why he says that? So that every one of us realize that we can't go to heaven based on our own. We are living in darkness. We are depraved. We are without hope. What we need is mercy. And he goes, oh, mercy. I'm here to give you mercy. That's what the Savior is all about. Oh, the Savior is fulfilled when he takes our sins upon himself on that cross. Amen? Okay. Can't save yourselves. Sometimes we think we're pretty swift, though. I heard a story, a guy by the name of Lee Orchard, who um, was caught on video robbing some shopping bags from a shopper coming out of a store. He grabbed the bags, and he's running away. And in the video, you can see he turns to look. If he's getting away, if anybody's chasing him, and he runs smack dab into a brick wall and knocks himself out. That's about as smart as we get. Some people are going to repent when they hear the truth and see the light, and some when they feel the heat. My prayer is that when you run into enough brick walls, eventually you're going to say, maybe I need some help. And Jesus says, now we're talking. Let me tell you about a thing called grace. Now, I I said that you can't deny our spiritual condition, and and call the darkness light. But we live in a world that's doing that. But it doesn't work. You can't just say that good is bad and bad is good. You you just, you can't do that. That's what Isaiah warns us of, Isaiah 520. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. You know, and... It's so funny because as Pastor Steve is here, we've talked about these, this, this application of this verse before, how even in the church, we don't really want to hear the truth of God's word. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 4. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And it's just like an amazing thing. And I have heard... <laughs> I have actually heard people raised in the church, and I said, well, you get uh, premarital counseling. He said, when I do premarital counseling, I'm going to say, hey, listen, man, you need to be holy. You need to be, hold yourselves faithful until the day you get married. And I had, this was a pastor who went through premarital counseling with another pastor. This is before he was ordained. Uh, the pastor was ordained, but my friend went through premarital counseling, and, oh, our preacher said, oh, no. You need to experiment. Make sure you get the right person. And I'm sitting there going, what are, 
And that was from a pastor. You know what we have done? We have strayed from God's word, and it's just kind of like we condone and adopt the things of this world. We need to uh, uh, put those things away and get back to the scripture. Because God, just like he fulfilled every promise, I tell people, Christmas is not our salvation. Christmas is the revelation that God keeps his word and fulfills his promises. And so if he did it that accurately at the first advent, then we better be ready at the second advent because he's coming. And the scripture warns this time he's coming and the judgment's going to start with his church. And guess what? It better line up with this and not with popular culture. The scripture says, I don't like this verse. I almost took it out of this, this sermon. Hey, you don't have to like all the verses. They're all good. But listen, listen to Mark 4, 22. Listen, this is, this is like, um, for some of you, just go ahead and plug your ears now. Just, just. For nothing is hidden except to be revealed. Nor has anything then been secret but it, that it would come to light. Now, I want you to know something. One of the motivations I have in living in accordance with God's word and to seeking to be holy in my lifestyle is to know that there are no secrets. There are no secrets. And besides that, I always believe my mom is watching. <laughs> I ain't going to deal with her when I get to heaven. You know, I listen. The scripture says we need to live our lives. We are God's testimony. We're writing a chapter in his book, and it's got your name on it, on how you're living your life for him. I love, I love this story about that purse snatcher. Again, I don't know why I've got all these illustrations from when I first wrote this. I must have just been watching a bunch of the, those programs. A purse snatcher. Um, this, this clerk called 911 because there's a lady who had her purse stolen from her, and, and so the guy ran away, and he's running down the street, and uh, they, they got a good description of, of the guy, and uh, so they took off, and they caught the guy, and they brought him back to the convenience store for a positive identification by the lady. She's waiting at the convenience store, so she's standing out front with the police officer. The officers catch the, the guy who ran away, and they bring him, and they said, listen, we need you to stand out in front of our car for a positive identification of what just happened. And so he stands in front of the car. And so the officer says, okay, now we're going to do a positive identification. And that guy, the guy, the purse snatcher said, yes, officer, that's the lady I took the purse from. <laughs> I love stuff like that. It's always like, you can't make this stuff up, man. It's just... But, you know, I think that really that's the response that we need to have. You know, I think that guy did it out of ignorance and just getting excited about the wrong things, maybe. But what, until we're really willing to say, yes, Lord, I need a Savior. And the truth of the matter is, I'm going to tell you this right off. You need a Savior more than you actually think you do. We need to put that one in the bank. You know why? Because it makes my salvation more secure. Because my salvation doesn't depend upon me. It depends upon the Savior. But it depends on me for is to receive grace. And so what our response should be is just total thanksgiving. Thank you. That's a good prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray that together. Thank you, Jesus. Now think about all your sins and that he died for your sins. Thank you, Jesus. And your family, say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's a good sir, uh, prayer. Okay, let's go on. Now, so we're the ones who live in darkness. Second part of this, <laughs> they will see a great light. Oh, this is what Christmas is all about. The light has come. They didn't think it was going to come. It took too long. They thought all this stuff and all their circumstances and, and the promises were, there were something, religious thoughts from the past. But all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and he fulfills the scripture. It's referring to Jesus. Now, this is something that we've got to keep in mind. The, they, their scriptures that they revere and almost worship 
revealed that his name will be called Emmanuel. That's the Messiah, God with us. Okay, I can understand them saying, God with us. He's, he's always been with Israel. He's been with us. But then all of a sudden, we start discovering that the Messiah is going to be that God. His name is Pele, Yah, the fullness of the Godhead, isn't the Messiah. And then when Jesus fulfills all the scriptures, born in Bethlehem of a virgin, and he's doing all these miracles, how come they're not saying, now wait a second, the reason they didn't like Jesus is because he made himself out to be God. Absolutely, the Messiah is supposed to be God in the flesh. How come they weren't ready to receive this? See, Jesus is the true light who came into the world. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And he's the one who made the world. He made them. They should have known him. They should have smelled him. They should have felt his presence. But <laughs> they didn't see him. Because they loved the darkness. They were lost in the darkness. And even though they were religious and knew the words, they failed to recognize the God who filled those words. John 3, 19. This is the judgment. This, this is the judgment. I mean, he makes it very clear. What's the judgment? This is the judgment. The light came into the world, has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Now, until we admit that there's some comfort in the darkness, let me just tell you something. That is true. There's a lot of us in our relationships. The way we survive is keep everything nebulous. Don't tie anything down. Because there's a lot of flexibility when things are nebulous. And it's like we really don't want to see the truth. I heard a story about uh, someone who had been at a, a bar, and, and uh, there's these couples that they just don't have the guts or enough drink or whatever to, to make the connection, and so they just stay at the bar, and the bartender wants to close up, and he goes, how do you get rid of people who won't, who won't leave the bar, you know, that are still kind of courting each other? He goes, very simple. I turn on the fluorescent lights, and they catch a good glimpse of the other person. They usually go home. See, but Jesus came into the world to enlighten us. This is the truth. His own didn't receive him. His own didn't recognize him, but as many as received him, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to be called children of God. This is the basic gospel. It's all about the coming of light. John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You and I are called to not only recognize the light, but to receive the light, and then you and I have the light of life. It should make a difference in the way we live, on who we are, the way we see ourselves, the way we behave. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So I want that not only to the eternal light of God and the glory of God, like I said last week, the fullness of God's glory was seen in the face of Jesus when he was born and the shepherds came and looked. They saw the fullness of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But it's not just about the eternal light of God coming to this world at the nativity and the angels singing, peace on earth and goodwill to men. But it goes beyond that because it's that very light, that very glory that is now given as a gift to children of God, to you and me, as that light of his glory now is in us. And now the world who's living in darkness should see the light of God's glory in the face of Christ in your heart. That's that's what makes a Christian. It's not about joining a church. It's not about, about being good. It's about having Jesus in your heart. The light of his glory has got to transform us. Jesus is the Shekinah glory of God. Now, you know I'm going to do this, so I'll do it quickly. It's, the word Shekinah comes from the word Shekan. Shekan literally means dwelling or presence. Shekinah is the presence of God, okay? 
to dwell, the Shekinah is to dwell, to be present. There's also the word Mishkan, which is simply with the mem in front of Shekhan, Mishkan, which simply means the tabernacle. Now, see, you and I are called to have the Shekinah of God in the tabernacle, just like the Shekinah of God was in the tabernacle. And people would go to the tabernacle to experience the Shekinah of God, or Moses would. That's where the priest would minister in the presence of God. But now something's happened because now you and I are like the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Look at Exodus 25, verse 8. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. The word dwell means shakan. That is the word shakan. So it means that I may tabernacle among them. Now, what's really neat is it goes beyond just a distant thing outside of ourselves. Look at John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word dwelt, if you just circle that in your Bible, is the word skeono, uh, skeono, which means tabernacle. The, the word became flesh, and he tabernacled amongst us. And so we see a step of the promise being fulfilled in the Exodus passage, that it's not just the Shekinah of God in the tabernacle that Moses built, but now... God has showed up in the flesh, the word became flesh, and now he is dwelling amongst us. That is a step of the fulfillment that we see in Jesus. Oh, but it gets better. It gets better. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You hear that? You are the tabernacle. You are the temple. I want to propose you are the burning bush. Think about this. Let's, let's, let's be so bold to claim what the scripture is teaching us. I mean, think about the Shekinah that was manifest when Moses is tending sheep and all of us, and he sees a bush on fire, but it's not consumed, and he goes, and Jesus is in that bush, and he speaks, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I had a, a Shekinah experience with God. Or when the pillar of fire and smoke led the children of Israel or descended upon the tabernacle and the glory of God was manifest or led them through the Red Sea. Or when the Shekinah came upon the mountain and everything trembled and there was fire and smoke on that mountain. Or even when they worshiped. Can you imagine that? Remember when Solomon dedicated the temple and they, they dedicated to the glory of God came so powerfully on the temple that the priests had to get out? Everybody get out! Why? God showed up. Man, his glory showed up. Wouldn't it be so cool if we had to run out of this place because something is going on and it just, man, the Shekinah of God showed up. Isaiah had that experience before the throne and the temple and the, 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 his, the train of his robes filling the temple and the Angels cried out, holy, 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 and the glory of God is manifest. Pentecost, fire came down on the children that were gathered, the disciples gathered, the Holy Spirit came on them. Let me tell you, I believe that's the Shekinah of God that's been imparted to you so that you and I can become the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's no longer that the Apostle Paul has to be knocked down to the ground because Jesus is the great light. That great light is now in you. You and I contain a blessing Moses glowed with the glory of God because he stood in his presence. But what happens when the Christian is enveloped with him and he's inside of us? That's what God has promised. That's what Christmas is all about. But the thing is, would we be willing to step up to this? Because I know, even as I preach this, there might be people who say, no, no. I just, it's like a doctor said to one of his patients, not Dr. Weaver, but he's probably had something like this. He says, hey, you're in terrible shape. I think you actually said these words to me, Doc. <laughs> I think you did say you're going to die <laughs> if you don't change your habits. Um, you're in terrible shape. You're going to die in a month unless you make some changes. He said the best thing that you can do is to stop drinking, stop smoking, 
Stop wild living. No, you didn't say these things to me. Okay. Stop drinking. Stop smoking. Stop wild living. You need to start exercising. You need to start a new diet. And uh, the man looked at the doctor in all seriousness and said, that's the best thing I could do? And he said, yeah. He goes, what's the second best thing I could do? See, so many times you and I, it's like we don't want to really believe the fullness of what has been said. We just want to water it down and make it easier on ourselves. Let me tell you something. It's just plain and white. The Apostle Paul says this to the church in Ephesians 5, verse 8. You were formerly darkness. It didn't say in the darkness. It says, for you were formerly darkness. That's what you were. You were formerly darkness. But now... You are light, not in the light. You are light. For now, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I mean, that is so profound. When Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. And then in verse 16, it says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is heaven in heaven. Church, you and I need to take the gift of the light that came into the world. His own people didn't receive him, but as many that receive him become children of God, and then we need to allow the eternal light of God's glory to be in us, and now we have a ministry of dispensing light, letting his glory shine through us, our imperfections, our flaws, because we live in a a dark world. We live in a world that is lost and doesn't know their loss. And he said, you need to get saved. Saved from what? They don't even know that there's jeopardy. The king is at hand. And I close with the fact that one day, one of the worst days of my life when we lost a child. And I had to go to the hospital in New Braunfels. There's a lot of things I can't remember. I don't remember all the details of my wedding day. Almost all of them. But I remember this. I was so hurt and so devastated about what had just happened coming from the hospital. And I had to stop at the pharmacy to get some medicine. I stopped at an HEB in San Marcos, I mean, New Braunfels, to get a, some medicine for Chris. She stayed in the car, and I was worried about her in the car. And I walked in there, and I was walking in a fog. You know what I'm talking about, where you're bringing your own cloud with you? And I walked up to this pharmacist, and she had a little cross on. And I saw that cross, and I gave her the prescription. And she smiled at me, and she radiated. I could see something on her. I looked at her, and I went, are you a Christian? And she said, most definitely. And she started to share about what she just discovered on a walk to Emmaus from the Presbyterian church called Trestias, and how Jesus showed himself to her. I don't remember her name. I don't remember where that H-E-B was. I don't remember anything else, but I'll never forget the light I saw in that lady. You know why? Because I was lost in darkness, and I needed to see the face of Christ, and I saw it in her. There's a world that needs to see Jesus. And you are God's secret weapon. Go and shine. May the world see the light of God's glory in the face of Christ in you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Church, I'm going to give you an invitation to our time of prayer. Let me share these concerns with you. We need to pray for uh, Sheila um, Eichmann, uh, a passing of, uh, and her family, the passing of uh, a sister. We need to pray for Lori, uh, healing from sickness. We need to pray for, uh, is it Camellia, uh, conflict, or no, I'm sorry, family conflict. Uh, thankful for God's promises. Did you know that Christian families can have conflict? 
We need to pray for Pam uh, starting cancer. Um, uh, starting, I can't read y'all's writing, but Pam dealing with cancer. Um, we need to pray for uh, Morrison uh, Pleance, uh suffering from Parkinson's. Um, and I can't get all that. That's why I didn't get it. Simi Gravis. Um, uh, and uh, for her world, uh, it says pray for world peace. Someone's running for us. Uh, Miss America. World, world peace. And uh, let's pray for Israel, the reason for the season. Okay. Uh, and this is, um, uh, okay. Okay, these are the concerns we have today. Listen, we need to pray. There are some people that are at home that are sick. Uh, some in our choir. Uh, Rick is praying that he gets well enough to come here tonight. And I hope he well and well. Amen? Uh, so let's, let's pray for those. And I'm going to invite you to come to the prayer rail. This is a time of ministry. Church, it's time for us to get out of our pews and to, to pray for one another. And uh, if you don't want to come to the front but you need prayer, turn to the guy sitting next to you, the person sitting next to you, and so say, would you pray for me? Okay? And listen, if you get someone doing that to you, just say, Jesus. That's a good prayer. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Just, we just need to pray for each other. So I invite you to come. Let's just take a moment and just lift up these concerns to the Lord. Would you please come? If you want to be prayed for, Hold out your hands like this or meet me here in the center, okay? I'd be glad to anoint you with oil, whatever you need. Lord God, we lift up every need and every concern to you. We just thank you that you're a God who is faithful. Lord God, teach us to be a people who rejoice in the middle of our struggles as we realize how near you are to us. You hold us. You carry us. You are our peace. You are our strength. 
And you're the Savior who didn't come just to save us from our sins. Thank you for that. But to sustain us as we live our lives for you. Be our strength, our peace, our healer. And guide and direct our paths, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, church. Today, our commitment to him is heart to herald, angels sing. And today, as we sing that, I give an invitation. The most important thing that you could do is to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you have never done that, if you never publicly made that declaration, today's the day we invite you to come forward and say, I want to say in front of these, this company of saints, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So we invite you to come do that. If you need to rededicate your life to Christ, we invite you to come. If you simply need more prayer or you want to make this your church home, we invite you to come. Would you please stand and let's join together as we're singing the first and last verses of, um, what did I say we're singing? Heart to Herald. Heart to Herald, angels sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic host proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise each child of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Amen. Church, I want you to know one of my excited things about going through Advent and, and Christmas is getting to wear my robe since I don't wear it on a regular basis because it makes me remi reminds me I'm in my priestly function. And I want you to know before church was here, I came and prayed over this place. I blew a shofar. I spoke the words of the introduction of God's glory in Hebrew over this place. And I just speak the blessing of Almighty God upon you. And so as, as obeying the commandment that God gave to his priests, he says, my people shall be blessed. I invite you to take this blessing. This is God's blessing on you, his child. Please. Please do not leave your blessing in the pew. Please take it with you. Because God wants you to be blessed. Would you receive the blessing of God in the name of El Shaddai? The Lord your God is your God. The Lord is your blessing. He is your peace. I speak the name of Yeshua HaMashiach over you. The fullness of God's glory over you. You now are the light that shines in this world, the light of God's glory, the light of God's holiness, the light of God's love, grace, and mercy. Go forth as the healing balm of the Lord your God. And may the world be changed because people see Jesus in you. You are blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you and go in peace. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born upon this day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. 
Go in that comfort and joy, church. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Please join us at 7 p.m. for our Christmas Eve service. Come a little early if you want a good spot. Merry Christmas. <laughs>